Uh, allergies operate well all the time, but today they're overtime and overdrive. And I hope it doesn't uh, sound that bad. In my head, it sounds terrible. I need not tell you that we are living in a time when people love to redefine fundamental moral matters and a host of other things for that matter. For many years, corrupt people have worked feverishly to get us to believe that an unborn human baby is not a person, not even a human and only becomes one after birth, and sometimes that's even questioned. And frankly, I don't know where everybody who is out in far left field are on that particular matter. We're told that when a human reaches a time in life where he's no longer productive to society, and of course, that's left up to somebody to determine what are the marks of one not being productive for society, that such a one may be euthanized. We already have it in certain states to where a person has terminal illness before they reach the final stages of that terminal illness. So then they can uh, legally kill themselves. They have uh, ceased as far as the people who are euthanized to be worth anything to themselves or others. There's a view that says you cannot become a, a burden to society and not be productive. And that's really grown in the last years, and who knows how far it will go. We're very familiar with the efforts to change the roles of males and females, humans that is, and what marriage truly is. As far as the home is concerned, it is attacked in every way possible. From the different branches of government at every level, throughout our educational system, in the business world, and of course, for a long time from the entertainment crowd, the immorality of adultery, of fornication, of homosexuality, of transsexuality, and on down the road you can go with all sorts of perversions along that line, are declared, upheld, and displayed, and presented to be a normal thing among humans, and therefore completely acceptable to everybody. That's hitting us from every direction that it can. Thus, it is legal for homosexual marriages to exist. And who knows where all of that's going to wind up. I think it's just a matter of time to where prostitution will be legalized all over the country. And no telling what else. The definition of marriage <coughs> has been undergoing <coughs> change for quite a while. Most, if not all, states allow what's called no-fault divorces, permitting divorce or remarriage for any reason under any circumstances. And when you get among those churches and religious institutions, there are many of them who do not have a problem with adulterous unions, and they do that seemingly under the false concept of God's love and grace, and thus through that, then you're allowed to live pretty well any way you want to. And as I say all these things, I ask, can you think of any time in recent history when there's been a greater need to return to what the Bible teaches regarding God assigned roles of man and woman and the institution of marriage and all things connected therewith. When we study the Bible concerning marriage, 
we learn, number one, that it involves a man and a woman that only God can join together in marriage. Marriage today is pretty much looked upon as just the two people getting married, whatever they call marriage. And God's left out completely. Well, God ordained marriage. It came from the mind of God. It's revealed to man. And there's never been a scriptural marriage that weren't three involved. The two who are getting married and God who does the joining. And there's never been a marriage, according to God's will, that God did not join a man and a woman to be husband and wife. Marriage was revealed and ordained in the very beginning. Jesus reminds the Jews of that in Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5. And in Mark 10, you can see the same thing, verses 6 through 8. And they're hearkening back to Moses' inspired record of the same in Genesis 2, 21 through 24. God joins a man and a woman in holy matrimony. Civil government does not. Then why must we abide by civil government? The reason we abide by civil government, anything. We're taught to, wherein it does not contradict and fly in the face of God's will. But because there are laws involving civil law, involving marriage, then we meet those. I think it's interesting to try to illustrate how that changes is that when Joanne and I got married, and I'm sure it's true of several of you. You had to get a marriage license. You had to wait for a while. You had to have blood tests. And you had to have witnesses to sign the thing that is the marriage license. Well, all that's changed. Maybe that means, buddy, some of us got the knot tied tighter than others. <laughs> the point is, it was God who did the joining. And we, in obedience to Romans 13, then complied with civil law. God joins a man and a woman, and I like to keep it this way, in holy matrimony. Civil government doesn't do that, Matthew 19, 6. Wedding ceremonies and civil laws pertaining to marriage may and do vary <clears throat> from time to time and country to country and may reflect local custom. Oh, that's well and good. I've never attended a marriage like it's recorded in the Old Testament. Just read through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And have you ever been to a marriage like that? I haven't. Really, there was no civil law involved as we think of civil law. They had a particular time that at that point, they would be considered husband and wife. And really, it comes down to them holding themselves forward as husband and wife, understanding that God joined them together and they were keeping themselves from all others and they would be what the Bible describes as husband and wife. Whatever the custom or civil law, it's God who joins a man and a woman who are eligible to be husband and wife in marriage. It is God, not man, who defines the marriage relationship, who has the right to marry, who has a right to terminate a marriage? Well, it's in the book divine that we get the answer to those questions. We don't go to some marriage counselor, and we don't go to some politician or somebody in education. You're allowed to hear anything. And it doesn't make any difference how far people have gone away from the truths of God's Word, whether moral or spiritual. We must continue to abide by the truth. I've always thought it was highly significant that when God saw fit to destroy the world and the great universal flood, that when you read about Noah, one of the things that stands out about Noah and about his three sons was that they were all married as it is in the beginning. That as bad as things had gotten, to the point to where God says, these people's mind are only on evil continually. I'll destroy them. And the patriarchal law did not have all of the details. It wasn't even written down that you have for the law of Moses for the Jews or in the New Testament. But moral laws were there, and they were expected to keep them. And God, at time dealing through the head of the family, the patriarch, would try their faith from time to time. 
And thus, Genesis 22 records that God tried or tested the faith of God in Abraham. And when you come then to Noah, you see he is withstanding all this evil in the world. And he has one wife. Shem has a wife. Ham has a wife. And Japheth has a wife. When evidently, all around them, marriage meant nothing to those people. May I say that let us walk in the steps of faithful Noah in our day and time when morality, as it's taught in the Bible, means nothing to most people. Sadly, there will be inroads in the church. It's not by accident that the letters you read to churches in the New Testament were written telling them, don't get mixed up with the world. And you will notice in Galatians 5, the marks of worldly people. And basically it says, Christians who are faithful to God don't do this. Then it tells you plainly the fruit of the Spirit, and it, here's what Christians do. Here's how Christians think. Marriage is a privilege. It's also a responsibility to God, a privilege given to us from God. The single man and the single woman, Genesis 2, 21 through 24, and Jesus echoes that in Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5. Who are, I used to wouldn't have to say this, but I do now in defining it. Who are genetically male and female and thus are created for the marriage union to be together as the Bible defines it as one flesh. The biological design of male and female is in itself proof that the two are needed in order to have a marriage and in the reproductive process. And God doesn't intend, intend for man to reproduce except from scriptural marriages. Now that doesn't stop people from having babies every way they can and who cares about marriage. But that's our free will in this world where God says you can do that if you want to but you must suffer the consequences and all those consequences aren't just being cast into hell at the end of time when this world is no more. A lot of it is just exactly what we're seeing right now in this world. In all sorts of mental and emotional cases of homes that are absolutely destroyed and kids being what they are and doing what they do. It's just an outright mess when it comes to thinking of homes overall, as you call them that, and then thinking of the Bible's teaching on the same. So biological design reveals that God created the male and female for heterosexual union and not homosexual union. I've often wondered, and it's a bit humorous in a bad situation, what are people going to do if they think there's some other sex besides male and female when they go to buy something to fix their plumbing? We often say, I need a female such and such. Or I need a male such and such. Well, that's copied after the fact there's a male and female, and everybody knows what it is in humans. Well, I'm waiting for one of, the, one of those persons waiting on you to say, well, we have something other than a male and female. Would you like that? No, don't believe so. I want my plumbing done right. But that's where we get to when we do things like that. So a person with a reproductive organ cannot say that God made him or her for union with a person of the same sex. Oh, they can say it, of course. You can say anything. That doesn't make it in harmony with God's will or what the Bible teaches. Marriage, then, is for a man and woman who are eligible for marriage. It's also for the widow or widower, Romans 7, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. And those passages simply teach that when a spouse dies, then the one remaining alive is free from the marriage bond, and they're free to marry again if they so choose, as long as they marry in harmony with the teaching of God on marriage. Otherwise, uh, what would you have? Remember, God joins a man and woman together for life. So when one's life's over, they cease to be joined together. Death releases the surviving spouse from the marriage bond. 
it needs to be emphasized and people need to think about it before they get into a marriage when it comes to this till death do us part. If that vow is not to be taken seriously, I don't know which one should. It's for the scripture of divorce. Matthew 19, 9 is clear. That's what the whole thing was about. It started this discussion. It's recorded by Matthew in chapter 19. Because the Jews were putting their wives away for any cause. Just want to be rid of them, so they did. So Jesus again starts here and says, well, that was tolerated under the law of Moses. But notice how he does it. Verse 3 says, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. They're trying it. And saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I like the way Jesus dealt with it. He tried to get them to say, uh, remember back what you've studied all your life? And what does that mean? He says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain or two be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That land has the force of command. You don't even attempt to. In fact, if you look at the Greek grammar here, it's pretty well saying God's joined it together. And don't you even attempt put it asunder because in reality when God's joined it it's that way you can't do it it would be like this a person from the heart has obeyed the gospel of Christ can anybody undo that no it's the same thing when it comes to this till death do us part then it's for the scripturally divorced and verse 9 gets into that Jesus says, I, I say unto you, probably a better translation in the Greek is, but I say unto you, whosoever, how broad is whosoever? Broad is the human race. Shall put away his wife, and then here's the clause of exception. Except it be for fornication. And if you turn to Matthew 10, he doesn't give the exception, or rather Mark 10, he doesn't give the exception. That bothers some people. Well, it's no more finding something in John that's not in Matthew that, or Mark, but is in Luke, that doesn't mean that they contradict one another. It means you have to take the totality of the information bearing on the subject. And you don't have the totality of it until you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in this case. Then you can form your view when you take all of what was said. So, and shall marry another, commits adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Spouse commits fornication. It'd be wonderful if they could reconcile. Forgiveness could take place. That'd be great. I think it ought to be tried, if at all possible. Circumstances alter cases. But the one who's the innocent spouse has authority from God Almighty to put away the fornicating spouse. But the one free of fornication, the innocent spouse, is authorized by God to contract it another marriage as it's taught in Matthew 19.6. Only one exception is given in the scripture then for divorce or remarriage. A person may put away one's spouse for having committed fornication and then remarry someone eligible for marriage and they won't commit adultery when they do it. <coughs> now those are the only three classes that are authorized by Jesus in the New Testament to marry. People never been married, widow, widower, or one who's put away a spouse who has committed fornication. We always say, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know that means Colossians three seventeen, doing as He's authorized. Well, now we've looked at the scriptures, and those are the ones that are authorized to engage in the Matthew chapter 19, verse 6 marriage. Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now I ask you, how many in the world, and even some in the church, and certainly among the denominations, really believe that and live by it? Well, compared to those who do, 
very, very, very few. But I remind you that it is not the numbers that determines what's right and wrong or what is truth and error. Remember Noah? He found grace in God's sight, but we know at least one reason he did. He was still serving God according to the laws of the patriarchal age and still had one wife. And each one of his sons had one wife apiece. But the rest of the world had gone haywire, if you want to call it that. And I imagine they were happy with having stood the tests that must have come their way when they were in that ark. And the world's completely destroyed. Even those who may have very well made light of them, mocked them, made fun of them, said, you're a bunch of strained ducks. You're not like us. Well, sometimes that has to be. And if we all live all day long, every day, wherever we are, as the New Testament authorizes, more and more is this world around us going to think we are strange ducks. <laughs> but also those opportunities can come because people may say, why do you do this? Or, why do you not do that? And we can make opportunities to teach others the truth. Only God's authorized to dictate the definition in terms of marriage. So when people reject Him or Reject the Bible as the infallible, errant, all sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17, then they're liable to do anything. There's no end to what people will do or attempt to do when they are not governed all the way around, upside down, inside out, by the authority of Jesus Christ, because He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14 6. People who are willing to submit to God's definition in terms, can be assured that when they marry, God indeed joins them together as husband and wife. For those so joined, again, let me emphasize, only God can put asunder. A man may try to do it, but God must authorize it. And when you see, and we won't go into it any more than that, what was being done under the law of Moses by the Pharisees and others, then that's what they were trying to do. God permitted that, as I said earlier, for a while. But then came the New Testament. Let's emphasize this. God approves two reasons for ending a marriage. The death of one spouse, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. And the fornication of one spouse, spouse with the innocent party putting the guilty party away. Matthew 5, 32, 19, 9. Now somebody comes up and says, what about separation? Or what about abandonment? Well, if you read 1 Corinthians 7, 5, then go down a little further and read verses 10 and 11, you'll see as Paul addresses that in the church, he says, Separation's all right if you agree to do it for a stipulated period of time. But it's not something you just say, all right, we won't go through the process of divorce, but we won't live together anymore. That's never taught in the New Testament. And it was for prayer and fasting when they decided to do this. And then they must agree to come back together, lest they be tempted, and that's sexual temptation. <laughs> Because God intended all sexual relations to be in a God-ordained marriage and nowhere else. What about if you're abandoned by an unbeliever? Well, you're abandoned. <laughs> he or she has left you because you are a faithful Christian. But nowhere does that say the marriage is dissolved. We usually, for those who hear me preach and have been around a while, talk about Brother Bale's false doctrine of saying you have got to be in the church before Matthew 19, 9, etc. or Matthew 19, 6 is applicable. If you're outside the church, those don't apply to you. So you can marry and divorce many times you want to. Until you're baptized, then you've got to abide by Matthew 19, 6 and 9. But he also taught that if you were abandoned by a mate, that that also allowed you to go ahead and contract another marriage. There's nothing said in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16 about anything like that. What he does teach is 
indicates that they must have been very concerned for the one that was abandoned about how do I continue in this marriage, which indicates more they want the marriage to continue than it does for it to dissolve. And Paul simply says you're not under bondage. You don't have to, if this fellow doesn't want to live with you, you don't chase him all over the world and say, yeah, I'm going to be your wife whether you like it or not. Which is really absurd, isn't it? But it does not speak to another reason for divorcing you so you can marry somebody else. It just tells you you're not under the obligation that you would be if you were a wife in the home and he's in the home and so forth. He don't want to be with you. And if that context is right, he's left you because you are a Christian. He doesn't like that. So that particular question that was asked him and answered in the First Corinthians epistle is dealing with abandonment and separation. It has nothing to do with another reason for divorcing one and marrying somebody else. It tells you how to live under those circumstances. It may very well be that a person may have to live a celibate life due to their circumstances. Well, since when did the Lord say, Oh, you serve me. But now, I don't expect you to live a celibate life. That's just too hard for you, so you don't have to do that. Well, you can't find anything taught like that in the New Testament. Anybody can choose to live a celibate life if they want to, such as Paul. Must not require of anybody. But it may be that if you've got yourself in a situation where there is a marriage that's ended, as far as men are concerned, by one leaving... And there's no fornication involved, then you have no authority from the Lord to put such a person away. Rarely does that happen. Usually there's a man or a woman somewhere else involved. Nowadays, maybe several. Who knows? Reject God's word, and one must be prepared to face grave consequences God will judge fornicators and adulterers along with all others who are guilty of sin and now we speak of immorality as a kind of sin Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 marriage in the bed is undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge can it get plainer what does it say about us needing more than ever to teach the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. An old man in the first place I preached full-time would joke about this. He'd say, well, I told my wife. She said, she's never leaving me because anywhere she went, I was going. <laughs> well, in a sense, that teaches a pretty good lesson. Are we that determined to stay in a scriptural marriage? It doesn't mean there's not going to be some problems. Anybody ever know of a marriage that didn't involve some problems? Well, when two people want to work them out according to God's holy word, they work through them. That's just the way it's supposed to be. Are there problems in living the Christian life by a single person? Well, just read Paul writing about himself. And he tells you a lot of problems he faced. There wasn't a woman involved. So it's not a matter of facing all the problems that come upon us because we're determined in whatever situation to abide by the Lord's will no matter what. It's a matter of letting the Bible solve those problems when they arise. The Lord never did promise you or me or anybody else, obey the gospel, become a Christian, and there will be no more problems. He taught right the opposite. He said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. When you deny yourself, then you're doing it to embrace the truth of Christ and live by it no matter what else. God's people are going to inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. And thus we must teach the truth of marriage, divorce, remarriage. We must teach the truth on male and female. We must teach the truth on all those things. Those who accept Jesus' teaching on marriage, divorce, remarriage, as we close, have the assurance that God joins them in holy matrimony. They will avoid the sin and trauma of causing adultery or committing adultery. And they have the expectation of entering the eternal kingdom of heaven. 
Well, it may mean for some celibacy in their life. And those who reject the Bible's teaching on the home and marriage, divorce and remarriage, they may have papers for all sorts of legislatures and courts saying they're divorced or married, whichever the case might be. But God continues to hold them accountable to the Bible's teaching on these matters. They have no hope, of course, if they act this way of inheriting the kingdom of God. Though there may be some sort of pleasure or temporal bliss. But Moses turned that down to suffer reproach with the people of God because he could see beyond his life. Jesus said that those who would be his disciples must abide in his words and thus observe his teaching. John 8, 31 and 32, and Matthew 28, 18 and through 20. So how, how will you react to the teachings of Jesus? That's what I must ask, whatever the topic may be. How do I respond to the truth when I learn it? Remember a few weeks ago we studied John 6, 66 through 68. Well, the scripture says from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him because they considered what he was teaching a hard saying. <laughs> then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. So the question comes down to whatever it is the Bible reveals to us that we're obligated to do, whether it's morally or religiously, and no matter how many other people are walking right the other direction and even fighting us on it, we must be willing to follow the words of Jesus for He and He alone offers eternal life. This is a very general study, but I think it's significant and important. And I do know this, that the people around about us throughout the world believe what I taught this morning. It would change a whole lot of things, more than anybody can even realize. But if you're not a Christian, then you need to begin there by believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. If you've reached that stage in your approach to Jesus, you're ready to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Now, if you've done that, you need to confess Christ to be the Son of God. That'll qualify you to finish your obedience to the gospel, and you can be immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of your sins. The Lord glad you at His church, and in that church you can live faithful to Him. If you're a child of God and you've sinned, we urge you to have a tender heart that it'll cause you to repent of whatever that sin is and that you'll confess it and pray God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? Do you need to obey the truth? If so, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.